Coming up on this episode of Greyhound Nation, John interviews Gary Gashoni about his life in Greyhound racing. It all started at his father's racing kennel in the 1960s, and his Greyhound story continues to this day. Keep listening. The Nation is next. This is Greyhound Nation, episode 24, recorded September 23rd, 2021. Gary Gashoni, a life in Greyhound racing. Greyhound Nation is a podcast for Greyhound enthusiasts produced by Greyhound enthusiasts. To learn more about our show and its hosts, visit our website at greyhoundnation.dog. That's greyhoundnation.dog. Welcome to another episode of the Greyhound Nation podcast. I'm Michael Burns. Now, here's your host, John Parker. Welcome back, Greyhound lovers, to the undisputed best Greyhound podcast in the world. We're pleased today to have as our guest, Gary Gushoni, former executive director of the National Greyhound Association, Greyhound author, keeper of the American Stud Book, and second generation Greyhound man. Gary, welcome. Thank you, John. Good to be here. And you're coming to us live and in person from Abilene, Kansas, the Greyhound capital of North America. Well, that's true. Good deal. So let's begin at the beginning and talk about your family's background in Greyhounds. Uh, your dad, I believe, was a Greyhound man. Tell us about him. Well, it, it all happened because of the fact that we lived in Butte, Montana, and um in Charlie's uh, recent book, uh, Please Mister, he mentions in there that uh, uh, Opie Smith was a prize fight uh, manager in Butte. And Butte had uh, racetracks going back to the uh, 30s uh, on up through the 50s. And through the fact that the Greyhound track was there, my dad got involved in Greyhound racing. Uh, he became a uh, I think he was the racing secretary at the track. He owned a kennel at the track, which is an unheard of situation. And uh, he was probably also the top gambler at the track. So uh, it, it was an interesting thing, uh, the roles that my dad played in that. But he owned a few greyhounds, had a kennel racing there, and I was involved uh, with, uh, with his kennel and in raising some pups. And I even worked in the paddock at the track, cleaning the... Uh, uh, the kennels in the paddock area of uh, papers and replacing with uh, good papers for, I don't know, I must have been nine years old. So it's kind of a chicken and egg thing. Was he a, uh, was he a track employee first or a greyhound breeder and owner first? Can't recall, John. I, I don't know. It all seemed to happen around the same time. <laughs> uh, just don't know. What was the name of the track? The track was a Western Montana Kennel Club, and prior to that, there had been a uh, Highland Kennel Club and a Butte Kennel Club. There had been three different tracks over the over the previous years. Uh, Kennel Club always seemed to be such an interesting name to put out the name of a racetrack. I don't know why they didn't just call it a, a racetrack, a race program, or a park. Uh, you know, but Kennel Club seemed to be the the pop thing to go by in those days and there were so many of those back in the 50s 60s 70s even perhaps it seemed a little posher the kennel club yeah possibly that was possibly <laughs> it. you know and i love the names of the racetracks that that didn't fall into that mode you know we had wonderland and and uh, derby lane probably the you know the best name of them all but uh uh, even later on woodlands things like that that broke away from the clinic club or even greyhound park uh yeah, yeah. They were very colorful and good names yeah uh yeah and that's another posh name you know gray the so-and-so greyhound park mm -hmm. yep yep now um what um uh, did op smith have any connection to it back in its earliest uh iteration i don't know if he did or not uh let's see i had i was looking in uh hartwell's book the other day it would have been 12 26 through 28 and then again in 1931 so he may be, have well been involved with it the fact that he had a background in Butte as a prize fight uh promoter and manager uh certainly could have been a link to why Butte had uh, gotten a racetrack that early uh, 
Uh, it was a city back then, mining city, a city of about 100,000 people. And uh, uh, because of it being a mining town, it seemed like it would be a, a ripe place to put a racetrack. But I, I wouldn't be surprised if there was a connection with his past in, in um, Butte having a racetrack. Yeah, yeah. Now, did you keep, did your family keep greyhounds at home in terms of uh, breeding stock or litters and that sort of thing? My dad uh, bought a uh, farm south of town, real close to the racetrack. And uh, he had a, a kennel there where he kept racing, uh, the racing greyhounds. And he also raised some pups there on that farm. Um, so it was really handy being right there next to the racetrack. And then he had a racing operation right in the track, a kennel uh, uh, that was listed as a racing kennel itself. What was your first job, uh, Greyhound wise, Greyhound care wise, that you remember? Oh my goodness! Uh, again, <laughs> cleaning the cleaning the kennels, turning the uh, turning the Greyhounds out and whatnot, filling up the water buckets. Just uh, I was uh, a a handyman in the in the kennel. Charlie Blanning reports that uh, one of his early jobs was to uh, uh, keep the puppies occupied, play with the puppies. Oh. Uh, did you do that sort of thing? Yeah, get in the crates with them or when they're in their pens and just sit around. It really wasn't an assignment. It was just something that we did, uh, you know, because they were so fun to play with and everything. Yeah, yeah. Now, was the Butte, Montana track a seasonal track or year round? Oh, definitely seasonal. Uh, maybe 60 days. I don't recall it. It was a 90 day, but it was a short summer uh, meet. And um, Hartwell's book says it was only open for like three years and then skipped to 31 for another year. This would have been the Highland uh, Highland Kennel Club track. Yeah. So. So give us a give us a circa time for you uh, when you started uh, going to the, the Butte track. What, what about what year are we talking about? Mm, that would have been, I think, the third grade for me. I would have been what eight or nine, so fifty-seven. Yeah, right in that area, nineteen fifty-seven. Yeah. So right, yeah, pretty young. And uh, but the kennel and the and the pups that were around, they were they were there to take care of throughout the winter months too. Growing up there, and it was cold, uh, and they would get the shaggiest hair. Come spring, they were you know they <laughs> hardly looked like greyhounds. <laughs> The water buckets would freeze so badly in the middle of the winter and and whatnot. My dad later moved to Great Falls and had a farm up there as well, uh, raising greyhounds. By that time, it was uh, early 60s, and I was uh, quite a bit older. What uh, was the Butte track a, a fairly competitive track in those days? Was it considered a top, middle, or lower end track? I had no idea. There was nothing I had to tell me how many racetracks there were, um, how it compared with other racetracks. It was the only thing I knew, but it wasn't until we moved to Great Falls and then my dad got uh, deeper into the business and we were getting the coursing news from the NGA and the Greyhound racing record that you could really then see uh, what was going on. By that time, uh, Butte was history. Uh, there was a track in Great Falls called Glacier uh, Greyhound Park uh, that was open a couple of years in the early 60s. And um, but then my dad was raising greyhounds to race in other parts of the country in Florida, Miami. And um, so that was really getting me enthused about it. And then my dad took us on a trip to uh, Portland in 1964. He had some pups over there with a lady named Frances Downing. And uh, he had uh, these pups racing at the track, Multnomah Kennel Club. And uh, we got to see the puppy derby that year where Big Forge uh, edged out more ability uh, to outstanding greyhounds. Big Forge would run second, I think, in the American Derby uh, a year later. And more ability became the youngest All-American up to that point uh, ever. And uh, so I was hooked at that point. I just I couldn't wait to get my dad's programs in the mail and the racing record and the coursing news. And I actually started, I was so enthused about it, John, that what I would do it, I would start compiling the sire standings because I, I just couldn't wait for them to come out in a racing record. And my dad said, what are you doing that for? And I, I told him, I says, I'm just curious. I'd like to know, you know, who's going to be the next number one stud and all this and that. He says, why don't you do something with brood matrons? 
Um, and that started the brood matron standings in 1965, never had been kept before. I was a sophomore in high school and uh, started compiling those and, and doing that for the racing record. And uh, that's how I got going. And then I went to journalism school and, and automatically started writing some stories to go with my standings for the racing record. And then later the coursing news as well. So you see Multnomah, the Multnomah visit as kind of the, what really the turning point that really lit your fire about greyhounds and pedigrees and, and just the whole racing picture. Correct. Yeah, yeah. That, that was a big uh, turning point, I think, at that. Now, you told me once a fairly humorous story about um, the qualifications to uh, have a wager. I believe it was at the Butte track if you were, young, if, if you were a young person. They had no particular minimum age, but they did have one qualifier. Can you tell us about that? Uh, Butte, Butte was a wide open town. You know, I mean, as a mining town and everything, they had uh, houses of ill repute. Uh, I learned later on, John, uh, <laughs> about those. But the, the, uh, uh, the big thing at the racetrack is I, as an eight or nine year old, as long as I could reach the window and put my money on the... Uh, to the ticket seller, I could buy a ticket. And I recall that one of my ticket uh, sellers was my third grade teacher <laughs> and no problem. But again, I didn't have anything to compare this with. I didn't know that that was something that, you know, went on everywhere. <laughs> Being from Butte, most everything else went on. So and how, uh, you're, you're about in the third grade at that point. Third, fourth Having grade, wagers yeah. at the Greyhound track. Correct, correct. Were you a, were you a skilled handicapper at that age? Oh yeah, I thought I was the best. You know, no, I don't know. <laughs> Dad was the handicapper. He he read the old Jack Fink books, and uh, who I got to meet later on when he was at the Black Hills track. But uh, um, I, it, a funny little thing. I remember one night my uncle was going to take us to the drive-in movies just down the street a little bit, and and it was uh, I think Bambi was being shown. So I left about $10 with my grandfather to make the bets for me while I was watching Bambi down the road in the, uh, at the drive-in theater. Silly. And did you give him discretion or did you tell him to, who to bet on? No, I told him who to bet on, but I don't remember that it worked out very well that night. <laughs> so so uh, did you actually, at some point, did your father hire you as a track employee, either at Butte or Great Falls? Uh, in Butte, I, I, I thought I was an official employee cleaning out those kennels in the paddock area, but I never got paid. And, <laughs> and I think I heard the rumor from my dad that the owner or the manager of the track uh, uh, saw to it that a lot of people didn't get paid when they suddenly closed down or whatever it was that happened, but I did not get a paycheck. So I don't know that I ever was an official employee of, of the Butte uh, Western Montana Kennel Club or not. <laughs> So you, you took us up to college. You were a journalism major. Where did you go to college? Uh, University of, Missou of Montana in Missoula. Uh, they had a very good journalism school uh, there. Um, I, one last thing about Butte, John, was uh, I did get to witness uh, the monkey jockey race. Oh, that's right. That's Why right. Not? We must talk about that. Tell us yeah. about that. Yeah. Well, I, I just remember the, the, the people that... Uh, brought the monkeys into town and they seemed to, to know exactly what they were doing and acclimating the dogs. And I just remember them racing. You asked me a, a month ago, whether did they come out of the starting box? And I said, I think they did. I, I thought about that over and over and I'm not exactly sure that they did, but I don't remember them getting hand slipped or anything. So <laughs> who knows? So now I've always wondered about that. Did the people, the, 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 the touring monkey guy, for lack of a better term, did he come with the monkeys only or did he have greyhounds with him that were already trained to have the monkeys on their back? I think, I think he just came with the monkeys and, you know, the slips and the whatever else a, a monkey jockey needs to run, <laughs> run his race. I, I, that's a good question. I, I, I don't think he brought any greyhounds with him, but they would go from track to track and, uh, you know, have regular appointments at those tracks to show and the tracks would advertise those with the local um, fans and, and they would come out to see this novelty. <laughs> and did the, uh, did you ever see the greyhounds being trained to accept 
the monkeys on their backs? And if so, how did they how did they take to it? I don't don't recall that. Don't recall. <laughs> I, all I can recall is you know, and all the races were at night then in Butte, no matinees or anything like that. But uh, yeah, all I can remember is that uh, yeah, and they they those monkeys they uh, they they were pretty. Uh, uh, had a lot of showed a little talent. Like, this wasn't their first ride in a race. You know? <laughs> they would actually urge the greyhound on, and, yeah, and so <laughs> they seem to be, you know, and and sit up a little bit, like I don't know, monkey. You see, monkey do, I guess. Maybe. <laughs> and uh, was it like one monkey race on on per card, or or how did they organize it like that? Best I can recall, yeah, maybe maybe one monkey race or two monkey races, and maybe they did a second night too, and then it was time to go on to, you know, Billings or Great Falls <laughs> or Rapid City or wherever. So, did uh, was it an official race? Could you wager on it? I don't. I don't recall that I ever wagered, which means I didn't know. I, I don't. <laughs> I don't know what they did <laughs> and every greyhound would, on on that given race would have a monkey on its back yes okay yeah <laughs> i've seen the pictures but I've, yeah. you're the first person i've ever talked to that actually saw it saw it live and in person it's a great story <laughs> well i i didn't think much of it at the time it was funny and it, it was uh you know interesting but uh yeah i guess uh it, it, it's been a lot of years before since that's uh, been done now, were you while you were in college? Were you doing anything in greyhound racing then, in terms of working at a track or working for your dad or anything like that? Uh, when I went to college, I was writing and keeping statistics. By this time, I think I had uh, inherited the sire standings, and so I was doing those as well as the brood matron standings and writing articles for the racing record on on those breeding uh, statistics um, in the summers. Uh, my dad, I, my father was such a key uh, influence on me as far as, as how my life turned out with regard to greyhound racing, but he, uh, he had gotten a booking at the Black Hills track through uh, Kenny Gunther, general manager, and had gotten me a, a, a job to work at the Black Hills track. This would have been in the summers of 68, 69, and 70 initially so the years that I was in college there so I would as soon as college was out would head down to uh, Rapid City South Dakota and work in a number of different positions um, maybe announcer chart writer um, starter uh, helping haul the frozen meat to the kennel guys anything Ken Ken had the knack of hiring young college guys and giving them numerous jobs that multitasking and uh, keeping the number of people on the payroll down. Uh, so a little track like that could survive, uh, but it was a great, a great learning experience. Plus my dad had a kennel racing at the Black Hills track. So I helped assist in the kennel a little bit as well. Uh, he had a puppy kennel uh, located off grounds over in a town called Black Hawk, I think a Black Hawk or Black Eagle. But, uh, uh, and I, that was one of my big responsibilities was taking care of those young pups. And it, when you were the announcer, did, were you a race caller as well? Or were you just the, the PA announcer to say, you know, race number 10 now coming to the paddock or that sort of thing? Just that, it was pretty basic. We didn't really uh, call much during the race, just let it be run. And, and uh, um, the crowds there were interesting because they were largely tourists. Uh, in the Black Hills, you know, great uh, uh, summer tourism attraction uh, to come to the Black Hills, see Mount Rushmore, and go to the Greyhound races in the evening. Um, so, uh, but it was uh, it was a good time. I think Black Hills opened the same year I was born in 1949, and uh, stayed open through I don't know when it was in the 90s or shortly thereafter after the 90s, and finally closed uh, closed its doors. Now, in those days, did they did they run eight greyhound races then, or were they six? Uh, eight dogs in a race. Yeah, it was eight. Um, and even back to Butte, it was eight dogs in a race. And typically, uh, how many races on a card? 
you know, they had gone from nine to 10. I think when I was getting interested in it, it was 10 and then I went to 11 and 12 and 13, you know, let's get more, 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 more. <laughs> but um, I think black back in the Black Hills, 12 might have been in those particular years, uh, the standard. And I don't remember, maybe later on, we would run maybe two matinees all summer, um, but mostly just night racing. Yeah. And did, did every track in those days have a series of stakes races that would be held throughout the season? Oh, yeah, that was pretty standard, I think. Um, you know, the inaugural, the Ovois was the final race of the season. And somewhere toward the end was the, the big derby uh, and then a king and queen stake and, you know, things like that. I would write the press releases for the radio stations and the newspaper, drop those off at one o'clock in the morning after the races on the door. You still desk. have some of those? No, I don't. No, <laughs> just these little press releases. I remember one article that I had uh, for the Rapid City uh, Journal appeared uh, when we landed men on the moon when uh -huh. it was like 68 or 69, whenever that was. And uh, um, I uh, kept that newspaper because here was Americans walking on the moon. And I had an article about so-and-so winning the hot box race <laughs> the night before the black hills track so yeah. <laughs> what uh did you own any greyhounds during that time gary did your father give you a part interest in any of his dogs or did you buy any part interest or I, uh dad gave my brother and myself each a greyhound from a uh from a litter that we raised up and uh, we were never really too successful they run a few races in in rapid city I don't know that he ever put them in our name officially with the NGA, but uh, they were ours. And yeah. uh, I got dabbled a little bit later on with my uh, old friend, Kenny Gunther. He was the general manager at the Black Hills. He was kind of like my godfather, uh, Kenny. He nurtured me along and he was a great, great guy in the Hall of Fame um, as one of the most respected track operators uh, in American history. Yeah. And then uh, when you when you graduated from college, did you go right into the to the Greyhound business or did you do something else? No, I, I uh, uh, was looking to uh, maybe uh, go to work for a racetrack or go to the NGA and work uh, while I was at the Black Hills. Norman McCasey, who was the executive director and keeper of the set book of the NGA, came up to the Black Hills and, and um, lobbied me to try to come to Abilene and, and work there. And I eventually did that in 1971. Um, so, but the years at the racetrack at the Black Hills were certainly uh, um, interesting and good for me to know, uh, you know, that side of the, the industry a little bit. And I did get a few offers from other racetracks later on, maybe to, uh, to move into management position with them, especially when I was on the governor's uh, advisory committee in Kansas. Uh, <laughs> some of the tracks that were looking to get a track open were trying to curry favor with members on, the, on that advisory committee. And I, I, I never seriously considered them, nor was my vote with any of them. <laughs> um, but they, uh, it was interesting that year where they were all jockeying to try to get uh, the license to run the racetrack in, uh, in Kansas, in Kansas City specifically. And so what year did you go to work for the NGA? I get, was it the NGA then or the NCA? It was the NCA actually. National uh, Course seventy one. Yeah. Yeah. In 71, it was 73 that I think they changed the name to National Greyhound Association. And uh, I, I stayed in Abilene for a couple of years. Uh, being a young 22 year old single person, Abilene wasn't exactly uh, a swing in place. place for me. So I went, I actually went back to work, uh, for Kenny Gunther at the black Hills in 73 and 74 met my future wife. She was the lure operator's daughter at the black Hills track. I I'd known Frank, her dad for five years before I ever met Terry, but when we got married and decided to settle down, Abilene seemed like a better option for a newly found family um, rather than working nights at a racetrack for the next 20 or 30 years so yeah yeah we 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 went to uh, phoenix looking at possibly working 
with them. Uh, Barry Baldwin uh, showed us around Black Canyon and Phoenix Greyhound Park and whatnot, and had a chance to um, uh, walk through the door for Delaware North down there at Phoenix. But in the end, we decided to go to Kansas, back to Kansas. So, and uh, that's where we stayed. And did you get your old job back at the NGA that you had had yeah. previously? Yes. Tell I us had, about I that had, job. I had continued uh, working, um, writing articles for the for the coursing news and working the meets uh, in Abilene. I would still come and do those things uh, for the year or two that I was off. And uh, yeah, they were welcomed me back. And I was Norman's assistant again. Uh, and kept that position until he passed away in 1982. Now, was the NGA uh, headquarters located at its present location there outside of Abilene at that time? Correct. Yeah. Even when I first got there in 71, we had been downtown in Abilene, I think, uh, going back into the early 60s, uh, when the building out in the country that everyone knows as the NGA headquarters was built. And, and did they have, uh, what was there back then when it was first built out there? I know they've got very nice, a very, it's almost like a park-like uh, environment with the, the statuary and the, the monuments and so forth. What, what was it like back then? Well, back uh, in, the, uh, in the 40s, when the, uh, the NG, NCA purchased that ground, it was to basically not just to establish headquarters, but to have a permanent site for the semi-annual meets. Uh, but the meets consisted of coursing and nothing but coursing. And then in 1971, the same year that I uh, arrived in Abilene, uh, the, the NGA, NCA committee uh, decided to build a racetrack and on the other side of the grandstand in the coursing park. And uh, with the idea that the future appeared to be in track racing, not in coursing, and uh, um, and to establish uh, the meet centering around the racetrack rather than coursing. Did the did the old NCA always have racing as a, as a component of its uh, of its mission? Yeah, it, it even the bylaws specified that there had to be at least one meet a year, and there were always two in the spring and in the fall, and. Uh, the coursing meets would attract, you know, upwards of a thousand greyhounds from mostly the Midwest, Texas, Oklahoma, and Kansas, Nebraska, Missouri, Colorado. Um, people would come in and uh, compete in the, in the old coursing crew. They, they loved their sport and um, it was, uh, it was a big attraction. And, and here would come these big time kennel operators from Miami and Boston and, and uh, Portland and Denver to to purchase dogs to take back to the track and and try to run them. So were the coursing greyhounds also entered in the racing competition as well? No, or were they said they were coursing only? They were coursing only. Uh, but before the racetrack was built, that was enough to get guys like Merrill Blair and Happy Stutz and the Randall family to to buy dogs. Uh, from directly from the breeders. There was no auction back in those days. Uh, that didn't come along until uh, late 70s, early 80s. So, and then, and then when somebody like Merrill Blair would buy a coursing greyhound, would he then transition it over to being a racing greyhound? Correct. Correct. Yeah. yeah. Uh, they would see something either in the breeding or the way the greyhound ran that they liked and felt. I think I think that was the way they uh, um, Merle Blair and Cal Ollinger purchased Flashy Sir. He was competing at a at uh, an NCA meet back then. I don't know if it would have been Abilene at the time, but um, he transitioned the Greyhound over to track racing, and he became, you know, one of our uh, immortal uh, first inductees into the Greyhound Hall of, Hall of Fame. Yeah. Now, when you when you started at the NCA in seventy one, was the Greyhound Hall of Fame there in Abilene at the time? Uh, in in word and name only, uh, there was a Hall of Fame, and there were pictures of those first inductees. They were uh, it was initiated as a joint effort between the AGTOA, the racetracks, and the NCA to establish a Hall of Fame and eventually build a museum 
but all of the artifacts and the, and the photos of all of the inductees were kept at the NCA headquarters out there in that same office, which was about a third of the size that it is now in this, uh, back then. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and then the uh, building was actually constructed in 1973 and dedicated in April of that year. And uh, were you there for that? Yes. Great what was ceremony. that like? Tell us about that. Great ceremony. I that was when I wasn't working full time at NGA, but I was there for the meet. It was during a spring meet, and all of the big wigs of racing were there: Al Lindsay, Al Ross, uh, uh, a, a whole a slew of racetrack operators and owners that came for that as well. And uh, uh, the city of Abilene was very pleased to have uh, you know this new museum come to town. We were working hand in hand back then with the Eisenhower Center and got that ideal location right across the street from the chapel where uh, Ike and Mamie uh, are buried. The architectures even seems a, a somewhat similar. The, yeah, the, they are, they are. I think that was part of the plan, you know, to, to make them uh, compatible. Yeah, uh, be great if there was still a, a video somewhere or a film of that, of that dedication ceremony, but I, I suspect that one doesn't exist. I don't think so. I've never seen one. Uh, there were pictures. I think I uh, we put it on the cover of the Greyhound Review uh, that uh, June uh, of 73. And, uh, you know, the whole board that was there at the time, again, like Ken Guthner, uh, my old uh, godfather was there. He was on the Hall of Fame board and Al Ross and Fred Scoggin, a breeder from Oklahoma. A lot of those old timers that are, you know, have long since passed. But yeah. yeah, it was it was a big moment. Yeah. Now, when you came back to the NGA, and I guess by that time it was the NGA after you got married and settled into Abilene. What was your what was your title and your your job then? I was assistant secretary treasurer, and editor of the Greyhound Review. So those were my basic uh, duties. And they had changed the name then of the coursing, what was it, the coursing record, I believe, or, or coursing, the coursing, the coursing news, news uh, was changed to the Greyhound Review. Mm -hmm. And uh, did you have uh, uh, something to do with the picking of that name? Oh, yeah. Yeah, that was, uh, everything was new, you know, we were trying to transition and, and get us into the the modern day of greyhound racing and whatnot so uh, a lot of the old coursing boys they were they weren't too happy with the fact that uh, we were changing the name of the association and the magazine to something that would cover the track racing as well and then the greyhound review would predominantly be uh racetrack news and features and uh, and whatnot uh, the coursing was still carried on for another four or five years till geraldo rivera and abc uh, uh, showed up and and at that point uh, the the committee decided to uh, discontinue coursing. Yeah, yeah, I've I've heard the stories about that and 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 I I, I was it even brought to my attention you could that, that video from that it was the first ABC 2020 program and and Geraldo <laughs> had a segment and uh, you can still find that video. It's not on YouTube. I'll have to figure out where I saw it, but uh, it's. It's, uh, you know, he's got his full 1970s uh, uh, or was it 80? Uh, it was the 70s. 70s disco hair, you know, and the whole bit. <laughs> <laughs> and he yeah. did a real hatchet job on the people. You know, it was the right. classic uh, edited uh, just just so and just to make everybody look bad and so forth. So, mm -hmm. but that that really did put the end to it, didn't it? Yeah, yeah, that was uh, uh, the... Uh, Geraldo and ABC never got on the grounds. They weren't permitted on the grounds, but they would still shoot video from the highway or from the air. I think they even had something shooting uh, some video on it. And uh, the board unanimously dis chose to uh, uh, discontinue at that point. And, and, and Norman McCasey had uh, everyone ready to take down the fences and everything related to the coursing park down the following Monday morning. Uh, <laughs> before Norman had had suffered through a lot of PR issues and interviews and questions from the media and whatnot for years. And he was, he was ready to move on from that. So yeah. uh, the fences and, and the posts came down really quickly on the course. <laughs> so, and now it's, uh, we were there just recently during the heart of America Greyhound gathering, and now it's planted in soybeans. 
Mm -hmm. Sometimes in wheat. Uh, the funny thing is, when coursing ended, the grandstand was still there. The grandstand was facing east, and the racetrack was on the west side of the grandstands. So if anybody coming in, they'd have to wonder what goofball decided to put a grandstand for the racetrack, but have it turned around the other way, facing the wrong way. <laughs> so yeah, a few years later, the uh, uh, the committee had the, the grandstand uh, rotated so that it uh, faced the racetrack. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, so you, it, it was 1982, I believe you said, that uh, your predecessor retired. Well, he, you, passed oh, he, passed he passed away. Oh, he passed away. He battled cancer for a couple of years and passed on. And you were the natural uh, candidate, I assume, for the for the position. Correct. Yeah. And was it was it called secretary treasurer back then, or when did you when did the title change to executive director? I think there was some bylaws changes, and it was decided by the board to put that in there as well. So it kind of was a combination of executive director secretary treasurer and keeper of the stud book so it was a pretty long handle <laughs> <laughs> so but, uh, well one of the things i always ask uh, uh that i enjoyed asking charlie blanning your british uh, uh compatriot and and uh, uh the keeper of the stud book in england tell us about some of the uh names uh, that were, weren't quite proper, that uh, that owners, uh, registrants tried to sneak past you as the keeper of the Greyhound stud book. Well, and sometimes they succeeded. Naive <laughs> guy from Montana, still a little wet behind the ears as I was, but uh, there would be names. So there would be times, you know, and the secretarial staff would catch a lot of them and, you know, put a, put a stop to them right there. Other times you had to be you know, just something that would arouse your uh, skepticism and say, if I spell that backwards, what is that going to spell, you know? And so <laughs> there would be some some naughty things, a few foreign words. Uh, there was a guy down in Texas who named the dog Gestapo. And, uh, you know, in the Midwest, uh, yeah, big deal, you know, he, he'd have been a Darth Vader and one of the bad guys. But in New England, that didn't go over so well. Gestapo <laughs> was a pretty, pretty good greyhound, uh, had his name changed. Um, so, and there were times there were, there were names that uh, either the racing commission or the track would say, you've got to change this if they're going to run at this racetrack. That's just not appropriate. That wouldn't happen very often. But th there were some offenders that, that were rather perennial in in <laughs> trying things i remember having to write a couple letters and say you know we know what you're up to we please <laughs> stop <laughs> you know? any uh any particular memorable ones come to mind oh my goodness probably some i couldn't mention here john uh <laughs> and, and better not but you know the thing with names we were pretty we gave a a pretty liberal boundaries on that where people could name names uh, the bylaws allowed that and uh, uh, had to be 16 letters of space. But we when, when did that when did the 16 letter space limitation come into play and what why 16? I think that was before I ever came to the NGA. And I think that was the kind of the admonition of the racetracks because of their printing system for the programs. You know, they didn't want it to be too long or uh, so. So 16 was set uh, on that. But um, there were there were names, the initials. If you go back to the 40s, 50s, and 60s and look at programs, the names never had any, you know, initial prefixes, yes. CPs, DMs, or whatever. And then that really caught on for some reason. I did not like that. Well, you you have a you have a a, a, a compatriot in Dennis McKeon. He he had is a great line about that. He says. These stadgum initials make oh. the make the dog sound like it's an auto part serial numbers. I know it, and is. I agree. I, you know, to me, there's nothing better than the and the greatest greyhounds of history had at most one word or two word names. Correct. Yeah, you know, Downing, Correct. Fortress, Fullerton. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, uh, you just can't get any better than that. No, and then when you put the DMs or whatever in front of it, it yeah. Just, degrades it doesn't make for a good headline it just it 
you know, I don't know. I was not a fan of it, but there were so many people that did that. And a lot of them were the bigger owners because Movers they wanted shakers. to identify their dogs in the programs and in the racing record charts easily enough. So they would do it. So it, there was no way to ever get that passed. I think there was an amendment one time to try to, you know, ban the initials, but it, it, it failed. It needed like two thirds to pass and it we couldn't do it. But could you, could you get a, could an owner get a, a, a license or a franchise for the exclusive use of a prefix like that, a couple of initials? Yes, that was incorporated uh, somewhere in the middle of my term as executive director. I recall that happening. Uh, but there were some guidelines there. You had to be using that uh, and nobody else or very few people uh, using it. Let's say like if there were uh, you know, a prefix like we, we've used said DMs already, and I don't know if that stands for anybody or not, but DMs. And let's say there was 25 DMs that had been named. You had better had at least 20 of those and uh, before you could apply uh, and get that prefix. Because, you know, you tell somebody else using DMs and now you tell them we well, can't use that anymore. You know, it, it did create some, some headaches. But yeah, most of, the, most of those common prefixes were eventually uh, reserved. Now, as you think back on it, what in, in your tenure as the keeper of the stud book, what was the real heyday for American Greyhound racing? Is 80s, 90s? When would you say it was? Well, you know, a lot of people would say the 80s. I think it was more, it really was getting started in the 60s. Um, and that was that period of time when I was getting so excited and enthused about racing. I remember there were every every new issue of the Greyhound racing record, there would be a track opening or closing and they would be saying things like, uh, the statistics are in for the end of the season and it was a record breaking year. Mutual handle was up 15%, attendance was up 10%. And this was common with virtually all of the racetracks at that time, it was just growing and growing and growing. But the thing was all of those tracks back then, pretty much all of them were seasonal. And when things started switching over to year round racing at more and more of the racetracks, those kind of, that kind of growth uh, stopped on an individual basis. Yes, there was parallel growth where we were moving into other states like Kansas and Texas and Iowa. Um, and so there was growth that way, but the individual tracks were no longer showing increases. And I thought, somewhere in the 80s when, when uh, Wisconsin legalized that the projections being made by the owners for the sake of the racing commission showed that they were anticipating declines in attendance and paramutual handle for the ensuing years. And I thought, that's a different thing. It was because they had year round racing. The takeout was high enough that it would, as a year round, if you went to the racetrack regularly and they were breaking the customer. Uh, but back in the heyday of 60s and 70s, the people would get a break from racing. I mean, what other sport do we know goes on 365 days a year? Yeah. We had, you know, football, basketball, baseball, they have their own seasons, you know, a beginning, a climax and the, and the finals. And then they would go shut down for six months, eight months, whatever it would be. And in New England, when they would close the tracks for the, uh, or the, yeah, the racetracks in, in the Boston area for the, for the winter, they had more fans coming out for the preseason schooling races at Raynham than we would see later on at racetracks on a regular night. They were so enthused to have racing come back and you know they had money in their pockets they were ready to bet and at those at that particular time in massachusetts they only had win place and show wagering there weren't all these exotics. is that right not even, not even quinellas or perfectas wow they might have had daily double but you know so people were huge per, uh, 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 amounts of money wagered in those pools and it was a different ball game yeah yeah. What uh, what's the most individuals you can remember the NGA registered during your tenure there in a year? 
any given year. I think there was um, a time in the 80s when we had a, a nearly 70 racetracks going, John. There was like 68, 69 racetracks that um, the, the maximum might have been 50,000, 52,000, something like that. that wow. Uh -huh. And how many, what was the staff at the NGA that you were Oh you my! Leading. How many did you have? How many staff members did you have? Counting the groundskeeper, uh, we had twenty-three uh, uh, people at one point. We needed to do this because we incorporated a new whelping report, and uh, you know all these things had to be checked as the applications would come in on these things. So we did. We had a staff of 20, 23 people at one point. Yeah. So let's uh, let's shift a little bit uh, to another part of of racing and greyhounds and that's adoption what what's your earliest recollection of your own personal contact with anybody in greyhound adoption the greyhound adoption movement how did you hear about it and so forth well i think it was from a, a group of ladies well in two areas one was in new england um and greyhound pets of america who was there was a, a lady up there that was very very active in in uh getting greyhounds adopted and she was friendly to the industry too and and uh gosh i wish i could remember her name now i think they named their annual award as great oh, joan dillon joan dillon in fact and i believe you were a recipient of that I, one year. I, I was and joan dillon was a, a great lady uh and uh she was very much involved and that was a lot of uh, that got me uh involved and interested in that and then there were some uh the ladies uh down in arizona and gloria sanders was involved with these ladies out of iowa and they became um part of the core of uh of the greyhound pets of america so what was your initial impression you know the, the legends are that the, some of the old-time traditionalist dog men uh, didn't, didn't favor it very much because they didn't think the average Joe, uh, or Josephine could handle a greyhound as a pet. Yeah. And so they, they weren't very enthusiastic about it. What was your, you remember what your initial impression was? Well, you know, when we were raising greyhounds back in Montana, uh, we had, uh, one particular greyhound that wouldn't stay in its pen. It, it would climb and get over the fence and come up to the door and come into the house and sleep at the foot of my bed. <laughs> you know, we didn't have to train it to be a pet or anything. I mean, he wanted to be a pet. And, and, uh, and so to me, it was, that was silly it, it, that they, we knew they could become good pets. And, and sadly, I think this was the last year at the at vet symposium down in Orlando, there was a visitor from Australia who was telling about the woes of the industry in Australia and how they were about to be shut down and that greyhounds there, they're different and that they would never make good pets. And I thought, baloney, what are you talking about? <laughs> need to get some of our people here in America and go down there and tell them, show them how, uh, how that can be, they can be adapted to that, you know, and virtually all of them can be placed in home, good homes as pets. So it sounds like you had a fairly good impression of what uh, of what the adoption movement was trying to do, and and that and you had a good relationship with them. I did, I did. Uh, supported them as as much as we possibly could. Tried to get the communication between the adoption community and the racing community. Uh, to communicate with each other, to walk a mile in each other's moccasins and to kind of understand where everything was coming from. And, and I think that worked really good when Rory was president of GPA, really, you know, befriended Rory. And, and we, uh, we worked toward bridging that difference between uh, the two organizations. And I think uh, it was, had a big impact. And, uh, Your name came up in our more recent episode with uh, Cynthia Brannigan, uh, and she talked about writing the uh, column from the home front for the Greyhound Review and how, you know, her attempt was to build that bridge that you mentioned. Who, who, how did that come about? Did you reach out to her or did she contact you and say, hey, how about if I write a column for the Greyhound Review? Oh, I don't remember the details, John, but I remember she had interviewed me for an article about 
pet adoption uh, and took a picture of me first time. She came to Abilene and took a picture of me with holding one of the uh, greeters from the Greyhound Hall of Fame and put it in the article. And so we kind of soon, you know, became friends from that. I, I don't know who initiated it, probably a, a joint effort, between both of us. I, hey, that'd be great. So yeah, no, yeah, she's a, she's a great lady and has done a lot uh, for Greyhound adoption, that's for sure. Well, one of the things I told her during the, the, uh, our interview of her was that, um, uh, you know, she became a fairly frequent speaker uh, at Greyhound adoption conferences and that sort of thing, as did you. Mm -hmm. And I told her that when, when Cynthia and Gary were on the card, so to speak, uh, they were, that was a big draw. I, you know, I, that's the first place I ever met you was at a, I think at a GPA convention. You always, everybody always wanted to hear from you you were the face of the industry. And I thought you made a great ambassador for the industry. Yeah, yeah. Well, I enjoyed uh, being with the people and, and helping promote that and to show them that we, you know, the Greyhound people don't have horns on their head and, and uh, you know, love the Greyhounds too. There's a lot of things that the Greyhound owners and the Greyhound world had in common with the adoption community. And uh so I, the progress that was made in that in the last 30 years has just been incredible. And the way it is now is it, just really an amazing, amazing thing. And I'm, I'm happy that it's, uh, it's gone in that way. Yeah, yeah. Let's talk about another thing that uh, was kind of a pioneering effort while you were at the NGA, and that's DNA. Tell, oh, us, yeah. how, tell, us, how, tell us about the origins of the use of, uh, of DNA to assure pedigree integrity. Well, you know, going back to when I was a kid, I would hear stories and legends and rumors and myths about who the real sire of certain dogs were. And one of the dogs in question was actually uh, Rineker, an excellent greyhound who became uh, a uh, very successful stud dog. And he's in the pedigree of most greyhounds now today. And there was a rumor afloat that he was not really out of Cleveland lad imported a, uh, an Australian Greyhound, but that he was uh, possibly out of rocker Mac imported. And the, and it went back to a story that they tried to breed the female to rocker Mac and it didn't happen. Well, maybe it did. And that, you know, that sort of thing. And it just kind of spread. So all of those rumors were going on about different dogs, you know, and there were, there were, uh, they were pretty, uh, uh, frequent. And, uh, you know, then comes the DNA uh, technology and what's going on. And we worked a little bit with Kansas State University and uh, Dr. Brad Fenwick over that uh, uh, issue. And uh, um, we who was the first person the at program. the NGA that said, hey, what about this DNA thing? Do you recall who first said it? Who, who first brought it to the NGA or who had the idea? I don't know. I don't know who that might have been, but <laughs> it really got hot when, uh, well, it was one of the top four or five stud dogs in America, and he was a homozygous black stud dog. In other words, the only color offspring he could produce were black, black and white, or white and black. That was it. No brindles, no fawns. The only gene he could throw was a black gene and it was dominant. So after 10,000 pups, this particular sire started throwing a few brindles. <laughs> and that really- I remember this digging, story. It really got us digging into the you know, prospects of DNA and, and we had it all checked out. And, and sure didn't, enough, the, uh, didn't the breeder, uh, one of his arguments yeah. was that as the dog got older, he was more likely to throw. Yeah, his, his genes were getting weaker or something, <laughs> and, and and that now he maybe he could could throw some brindles and stuff. And of course, doesn't work that way. But we checked it out and scientifically showed no, it could not. He could not be the sire of those of those pups. And were several litters that were um, uh, suspicious and were proven to be incorrect. Fortunately, we DNA tested all of the stud dogs in his uh, uh, kennel, and we were able to find who the sires really were. And so registered them properly? Pardon me? 
registered them properly after that and they, yes, they could race able to register all those pups properly um but uh you know we gave the man the harshest penalty we could and banned him from the industry and he was one of the most successful uh stud dog owners in the country at the time so it was a real a real shift and that really launched the dna program and ever since then john it's amazing how all those stories vanished. <laughs> I mean, we had people that would get pups mixed up in the kennel before they got tattooed, you know, and pens crawling under the fence and this sort of thing. And they would call us and tell us, you know, I think I got a problem here and I don't want to get in trouble. I want to get it right. And, um, and we would DNA the pups after they got tattooed. So we knew for certain what litters they belonged in and could separate them. So one guy, there was a guy from Colorado, very interesting. He had two litter mate females bred to the same stud dog and he got them mixed up. And I thought, whoa, you know, these gotta be pretty close. Not a problem. They separated just as easy as could be. Wow. It, amazing, that tightly bred with, you know, as they were. What was the DNA preservation system always the cheek swab or did they start with blood? Or it started with blood, yeah, it started with blood and we would freeze it. We had these freezers at the NGA and, and, uh, um, and then eventually went to the cheek swabs, yeah. And we didn't test everything. We kept everything on storage in the event we needed to. It was just too costly to be testing every pup, you know, to make sure it was correct. Yeah. But it acted as a deterrent where instead of maybe we were 95% accurate in our stud book, just grabbing a number out of the air. Now, maybe we were 99% accurate, which as keeper of the stud book really makes you feel good about that. Yeah. yeah. And I think it validated our pedigrees to the point where the purchasers of dogs were willing to pay that extra money in knowing that they were getting the pedigree they wanted in the dogs they were buying. Do you think the NGA was the first dog registry to, uh, to use uh, DNA? I mean, AKC was way behind oh, uh, on, on that. Do you, I, I think that's very possible. I know we were the, in the Greyhound world and then England and Ireland and Australia followed, followed suit with that. But uh, it, it's very possible we were. Was there, uh, was there any opposition to it? Oh yeah. Mostly from those that didn't like the new expense. Yeah. You know, uh, and that's always a, an issue, isn't it? <laughs> uh, don't want to. And do you think maybe thing. there were some people that have been playing a little fast and loose with the, uh, shall we say, sire identification and they, they knew that, you know, they could no longer do that with DNA. There were probably a few, there were probably some, I don't think, you know, what it made them do is go straight or get out, you know, yeah, yeah. and uh, um, it also helped with, you know, the other issue is about, about um, committing fraud on, this, on the registry was people that would long age dogs. In other words, maybe it had some pups that were really 12 months of age, but they would register them as four months. Yeah. Maybe backyard breeding their own bloodlines or switching some pups. And, and I think that helped that in that regard too, because if they were breeding to a public sire and uh, they were trying to do some long aging, if it was questioned, we could go check that to see, uh, it's not that litter, it was a different breeding that it came from. Yeah. Well, I think it helped, it helped in the policing of the industry and made the stud book uh, be much, have much more integrity. Yeah, yeah. I've always said that in the Greyhound world, the racing registries have, uh, have the far greater degree of pedigree integrity than the the kennel club type registries oh yeah i believe so you bet let's get to uh, a couple of other hallmarks of your life in greyhounds and one of them was your induction into the greyhound hall of fame oh yeah, yeah. what year was that i think it was 2009 i i, I think so john i uh, <laughs> but k smith uh, was inducted the same night i was and it was a special night yeah how did you find out you were being inducted um the hall of fame board uh, notified me and let me know that uh, that i was going to be inducted and i think i had most of my family there and and uh i i remember preparing my remarks and how much of them centered on my father and how much you know direction and guidance he had given me that steer me uh toward these these things uh, the passion and 
you know, really a, a love of the game. I always liked racing. As a little kid, I loved racing, whether it was people or animals or, or stock cars. I had uncles <laughs> that raced stock cars in Butte, Montana. And the, that track was close to the Greyhound track too. So, but uh, no, so, uh, uh, but yeah, I was a, it was a big uh, uh, milestone for me. Do you still have your speech? <laughs> I don't, I don't know. I'd have you to should, go back you should. I, I, yeah, I should have it somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe Terry can help you with that. And then the, the, the other thing uh, I want to get into is that you, you've written a couple of books. Tell us about those. Well, back in the, or would it have been the 80s, um, I started doing a, a Greyhound Breeders Journal which got into the more depth and percentages of how stud dogs were producing and uh, uh, would publish a, an annual book called Greyhound Breeders Journal, volume one, two, three, and four, covering the previous year. And, uh, um, and then it would have some history of some of the lines. Uh, and that kind of was expanded then when I did great names and greyhound pedigrees uh, the Blue Book, which went right back to the beginning of uh, Greyhound racing in the 1920s, uh, tracing back to the most prolific lines and the history of them and what they had produced. And then a decade or two later, I did uh, Great Names and Greyhound Pedigrees, uh, Volume 2, the 1980s. And uh, I had planned to do one for the 90s. But things were going bad in the business already. Things were starting to uh, decrease. Membership, NGA membership was going down. Breedings were going down. Tracks were starting to close. Casinos were really thriving and whatnot. And uh, I never got to, never did get to another volume of that. And it's sad to see what happens today with some of these great lines, you know, that you know were just so uh, contributive to the to uh, the greyhound that we have today, the professional athletes yeah yeah uh well uh brings me to your uh, my next question look into the crystal ball what uh uh what's going to happen with american greyhound racing mm. <laughs> your guess is as good as mine john i i, I just think there are you know and it, it looks bleak there's a lot of reasons to think that it's on its last legs the way it's conducted right now and what's going on but Hopefully it can keep going long enough that it might evolve uh, into something that will catch the enthusiasm of the American public again. And those that follow it at least uh, and love greyhounds will uh, uh, see a rebirth of some sort. It's encouraging that racing is doing pretty well in Australia from what I'm hearing. And um, there are people, the people out there that, that love the animal and love sports sports and love racing and love greyhound racing so we'll see we'll see what happens just keep keeping our fingers crossed that, yeah uh, it's yeah. been very tragic what's what's happened i've been uh, you know i followed this recent the winner of the irish derby Susie sapphire and right and and i think that's what america racing needs we need a a greyhound like that that catch, catches everybody Mm -hmm. everybody's imagination you know 22 months old wins six races in a row all the qualifying races first female to win since 99 on and on and on and we yeah. just need something like that to catch yeah. the imagination and return greyhound racing to as much a sport as a as a wagering opportunity exactly exactly and that's what made me so enthusiastic about it as a young lad was was I had heroes, Greyhound heroes that, you know, the Westy Wizards and Miss Worlds, they, they were the champions of that period. And they would, they didn't run just a year and then retire. They ran for three years. Miss Rural made all American three years in a row and was honorable mention in a fourth year. Yeah. Uh, and there were so many, uh, so many Greyhounds back in the sixties like that, that would end up running in two or three American derbies in a row, one each year, you know, so they're, it, 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 I don't know, I don't know what they seem to be, and it gave people a, enough time to um, become admirers and champions of those, those type dogs as, as we are, and yeah, yeah, and that was great, rather than just a numbers game, a betting game, you know, more and more racing was there, that's like I say, with the 15 race programs, 
they would just swamp the public was racing yeah. and not just for three or six or nine months period, but the whole year, yeah. every day. It's not special anymore. You yeah. Know, it's just, yeah. Yeah. So. Too much of a good thing. Exactly. Yeah. Now let's look to the past as we close out our conversation with you here. Uh, we, we could talk out about 20 different more subjects and we'll have you back, but I want you to tell us two things. Number one, best name you ever registered in terms of, your favorite name, cleverest, whatever may classify it for that reason. What was your favorite Greyhound name that you can remember? Wow. Uh, there were names of really good dogs that I, I really, I really liked. Secret Sessions was a dog. I think the Randalls had, and people like the Randalls and the Stutz um, and Walter's team they, and Keith Dillon these guys had the greatest names for dogs. Yeah. Yeah. No initials, no prefix, common prefix or suffix. It was, it was just, you know, real huntsman, um, syntax, unruly, uh, you know, dogs like that. Keith Dillon had, you know, a Bella and uh, Kiefer. It's, it's just, you know, quick, easy to. Yes. And they were spelled right. Yeah. <laughs> it's not like when people would spell the name so it would fit or it, it, that name would look terrible in a headline in a newspaper and that's not what you want to do yeah or yeah. run the names together so there was three or four words and you had to try to separate them so yes <laughs> i never did i was never a fan of that either <laughs> all right name. and then my 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 finale question for you looking back Greatest racing greyhound that ever lived in any oh. country. Oh, the greatest racing greyhound that ever lived in any yes. country. Oh my goodness, John. Wow. Um, I tell you what, that real huntsman we talked about, he would win races in a row, stake races at different venues. I, he was be hard to, to top, I think. It, it may have been real huntsman. I Did think you ever was, see him uh, race? Oh, no, 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 way before my, my time. Well, he was right around the, what did he win? The 49 and 1950. Ah, you were, you were a babe in arms. I was a baby. Yeah. But I tell you, you know, it, it, there's so many different categories, you know, there's the fastest greyhound. Yeah. And I, I, I've thought of that over the years and some of my great heroes were definitely not the fastest. Westy wizard wasn't miss world was great. She wasn't the fastest. I don't know if anybody could ever have beaten Kay's flack when he was healthy and sound. He was a monster. I, I mean, when you win the American Der or was it the American Derby, the Wonderland Derby, I think by as many lengths as he did over, you know, this was class greyhounds that he was running against and he would just demolish them. And he must've set track records, I think at three different tracks. Uh, so I don't know, maybe P's rambling could have run <laughs> with him, but this dog was a real, machine and uh I, I, you know maybe the perfect racer yeah uh, and he went on to be a good stud dog too yeah 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 like you say there's so many categories there's so many mm -hmm. uh you know distances and 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 exactly. abilities as stud dogs and and mm -hmm. durability and you know there's just so many categories you could you could yeah. name it makes yeah. it hard yeah but it's fun to play and they get a games with that in your mind you know, who would have beaten between these guys and and uh i don't know the match races that we have had were just fantastic the old uh rural i don't know flashy stir and uh lucky pilot match races and then later on the downing rooster cogburn series i really admire those guys that were willing to put those dogs up and willing to take the risk of losing for the sport to have something to really, you know, attract the attention of, of fans and to really uh, see that because there were sometimes guys wouldn't put their dog up. They were afraid it was going to hurt their stud career or diminish their chances to make all America team or whatever it was. Uh, but those guys that did it, bravo for them. They yeah. were, they were true greyhound sportsmen. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, let's hope that day returns again. Yeah, it'd be great. That yeah, would be great. And, you know, at least, we got to live through some of the greatest uh, times in the, in the industry and, and in the sport. And uh, they can't take that away from us. Yeah, absolutely. 
Well, Gary, we could go on and on and on. I always enjoy uh, uh, when we get together at various uh, adoption conferences or, or national meets. And, you know, the, the conversation could just go forever. But we, we wrap this up tonight. Uh, we'll yeah. have you back. There'll be many more topics to talk on. And we appreciate your spending the time with us. Thank you, John. I enjoyed it. Greyhound lovers, we'll see you in the next episode of the Greyhound Nation. Thanks so much for listening to the show. If you're not a regular listener, be sure to follow Greyhound Nation wherever you get your podcasts. We're also on social media, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Just search for Grey Nation Show, follow us, and you'll get notifications every time we release a new episode. If you like the episode, leave us a review on our Facebook page or your favorite podcast app. You can also send us feedback or questions via the contact form on our website at greyhoundnation.dog. That's greyhoundnation.dog. This episode was produced in collaboration with host John Parker. Our theme music was composed and performed by Dimitri Taras. Thanks to this episode's guest, Gary Gashoni. To learn more about the National Greyhound Association, visit ngagreyhounds.com. To learn more about the Greyhound Hall of Fame, visit greyhoundhalloffame.com. Or the next time you're passing through central Kansas, make a stop in Abilene. I'm Michael Burns, and you've been listening to Greyhound Nation.